Welcome to the SoFi Weekly Podcast. Sure. SoFi just got fined. They came public on Wednesday that they received a $500,000 fine plus $200,000 to be paid back uh, due to a share lending, essentially no real supervision for their shared lending program, which essentially might have been, they're, they're calling it misleading. I think it's a oversimplification or, or harsh terminology. They just essentially didn't have the best uh, procedures in place to make sure that people understood what they were signing up for. It's, it's not just SoFi. It's three other companies that are grouped with SoFi that are sharing a $2.6 million fine across the four of them. Like that's popular com- That's M1 Finance, Public, and SoGo Trade are the three other companies. So this is not just, you know, SoFi out in left field doing something shady. This is something that all of these companies are jointly sharing. And the payment, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, was without acknowledging any, you know, they're right or they're wrong. It was just like, hey, let's pay this amount to clear that up. I'm not in this exact industry, but being sort of around this and in the financial space, that uh, there are a couple of guidelines I find that are not exact, you know, check boxes. Like- the, the, the funny part I found, I think Stocko uh, tweeted about this, saying basically over the period of time that SoFi was fined for 2019 through 2022, something like that, their securities exchange made $8 million and they were fined something like 700K. Like problem is, is that that was revenue. So that doesn't also account for the cost to run the technology or any sort of other fees that might have been accrued. Just looking at that one cost in the revenue, I didn't think was fair enough. But yes, you're right. Like it's, it, it's definitely a small price to pay. Some people were worried that this kind of digs into the thesis of getting your money right, you're misleading investors. I think it's an oversimplification. It, the procedures on the back end were not that great. But yeah, compliance issues will be there constantly. That's the only hit is reputation hit. Anyone that actually knows anything, they'll look at that and be like, yeah, it's it's really a nothing. It doesn't mean they're doing anything shady. They weren't. They just needed to tighten up the standards a little bit. And that happens. That happens actually constantly with most of these companies. Something like this is very short-lived in a new cycle. And it's already ancient history. Do you think that this will get pushed over really quick? It's over. No, nobody knows about it. Nobody cares. Investors are even over it. It's done. Yeah, I agree with Roy. As a user, are you reading into the company's, you know, FINRA or SEC filings and saying, oh, like they did something unethical. Like it just, there's a massive disconnect, I feel, from the user base that uses that product and the investors. And then a couple of degrees, you know, orders of magnitude to us who micro analyze every little shred of SoFi news. The Q&A, Steve, what did you think? It was a waste of time because bad questions got upvoted. Like that's my problem with it. You have Noto taking time out of his day, LaPointe taking time out of his day. You have the executive team taking time out of their day and stupid questions get upvoted. It's ridiculous. You know, there are real questions that would have been very insightful that they could have went into Instead, it seemed like they were annoyed at some of them and just passed over them. Rightfully so, I'd be annoyed too, because anybody can read an article, listen to the conference call, and get pretty much all the information from what they were asking. It was just annoying. Any small cap stock is going to be like that when they open it up to retail, because we might have a very, very like single digit percentage of retail investors who are as informed, let's say, as as people who are listening to us right now and, and have been consistent listeners of SoFi Weekly. But the remaining retail investors are like one moon. Regardless of that, I think Anthony Noto and Chris Point, yeah, they answered the questions, they repeated themselves a bunch of times, but they also added really helpful context in the form of reiterating some key points. They reiterated gap profitability on a forward basis. So going forward, the expectation is gap profitability. They reiterated the revenue split being closer to 30, 30, 30. They reiterated the tech platform having higher margins in the new year. They reiterated the one-stop shop aspect, right? Of saying, hey, home loans, as an example, it's used to build trust. Trust leads to higher lifetime value. Higher lifetime value leads to better rates. It is a virtuous 
cycle in terms of how we do business. And those lower rates allow us to give more back to the consumer. And as a result of that, we form a moat that legacy institutions don't have. You know, 1 million plus members per quarter in 2025. All of these things, I think, serve as reinforcement for more retail investors to band behind. Because I guarantee you, the people who ask those questions might not even have been listening to that session to understand, you know, okay, here's really the moat because they can find it in all these other mediums. But the people who actually do their due diligence on SoFi will be listening for those nuggets of information and will be leveraging them to make forecasts going forward. Management did well in answering questions in a better way than even they were phrased, right? Some people said, when's profitability next? And then they went on to talk about capital constraints. They actually welcome questions like that. I mean, so far, I wouldn't need to do this just because the way retail is, but like if they could like push people to upload it, they absolutely would. There's two ways that they can handle it. Uh, they chose the rephrase a question and reformat it and give some extra additional information on it so people understand like nothing has changed. Capital constraints have not made an impact on that. Or they could just do the highlight reel, like, okay, real quick, we've got the question. Yeah, we're going to do gap profit profitability. No dividends anytime soon. That's something we'll look at in the future. We're a one-stop shop. Now let's look at some other uh, questions we'll go into more detail on. They may be a waste of our time, but not everybody is us. And there's things that I, uh, you know, I, I, I never mind hearing a company that I'm investing in reiterating again. And he is like, yes, we're on track. Quarter four, gap profitability, book it. I'm like, you cannot tell me that too much. That should be my ringtone, in fact. I'm okay with that. You know, just hearing it again and again. So not a waste of time. You know, before they said by 2024, 25, we'll probably uh, hope for 800,000 to maybe even uh, close to a million new members. Now they said by 2025, our hope is adding close to a million, if not more than a million per quarter. Did you see they increased their bonus, Tanner? Yes, I did. Let's talk about that. So whenever signing up for direct deposit through SoFi, you're going to get a big fat $300 rather than $250. 4.6% now, sign up bonus $300, yeah. They're being able to continue to cross all these products um, at the, the same rate as they have been before. And eventually, you know, interest rates will go down and things will be a little bit less attractive as far as putting your money in a bank. But banks tend to be sticky products. And uh, so... A lot of these folks that are, you know, adopting SoFi as their main bank, they're going to stick around for years and years and years. And so this will pay dividends in the future. So whatever they need to do at this point, you know, if they upped it to 350, 400, I mean, that's fine. The lower they can get people, the better, but you don't always have Taylor Swift selling your products uh, for nothing. A lot of different financial institutions offer bonuses to move money in. Not every financial institution offers a bonus for a direct deposit. It is very incentivized for a demographic that is just starting to get in the workplace and be in a position for direct deposit. And it's going after people that are more likely to be with SoFi on a long-term basis rather than people who are older that are more looking to move a larger amount of capital over, not necessarily do direct deposit. I think it's great what they're doing because I do think it's going to help attract a lot of people and at least it puts them in the conversation that even if the person doesn't ultimately go there, at least they're in the conversation, which gives them a chance of getting that person. It will bring up customer acquisition costs. I'm pretty sure even in the Q&A is where they reiterated it, is that they don't really look to just lower customer acquisition costs. They're doing it based on what the lifetime value of that client is. So they're happy to get a client at 400 or 500. If that person means that they're going to translate into $19,000 worth of lifetime value over the course of them having a loan and a direct deposit account and lower funding. So obviously they're hungry for, for more deposits. And they're happy to do so. It's the return on investment for them. They're putting out, they're going fishing right now. They're using that as their bait. The thing that I wanted to say, because immediately it popped into my mind was the timing around this, right? We know that these APY increases or the bonus changes, they're relatively short lived because of how frequently those incentives change around. Even over the summer, we saw SoFi competing head to head with Robinhood and others in terms of their rates. Management told us in the Q3 earnings call that the CAC cost, the customer acquisition cost would rise along with stock-based compensation and, and a couple of other metrics. But if they're fighting so hard for profitability, my mind immediately went, you know, why would you increase customer acquisition cost and fight for you know, so many more deposits just given where everything is 
right now? Like, what is the thought process behind that timing, given how pivotal that profitability piece is? That's the crazier part to me, because reading between the lines, you can just see the executive team saying, hey, we have gap profitability in the bag. We can, you know, go on the offensive by offering more incentives to people so that we can have future profits on new cohorts of users and increase our deposit amounts even more. Like they're not playing a very defensive conservative game to make sure that they just edge that scale by a little bit into the black. They're saying, hey, we've got it. Let's press forward. That's how I read into it. Why would they do this now? It's because they can. The more customers we get in the system before rates start falling, the better for future lending. To a degree, I mean, I, I, I do agree with that. However, I do think that there will be quite a lot of demand for new deposits without a need for a sign-up bonus if companies like Robinhood start slashing their rates before SoFi does. If we are the last large APY holder, which is what SoFi has talked about doing, in that case, do we need a super high Sign up bonus if people are going to be coming just for our rate alone. I, I I think it's going to matter what the other financial institutions are giving on a sign up bonus because to some people that matters. And quite honestly, if you're spending two or three hundred dollars and you're going to get five, ten, fifteen, twenty thousand over the lifetime of them being a member, I'm fine with them putting that initial capital up as the bait. I think it, it depends on the landscape. If nobody else is offering it, then it's not a big deal. But if you do have other competitors offering a sign-up bonus, people will take that into consideration. So the question becomes, do you want to get as many people as you can, or do you just want to get what you can? It becomes a different philosophy on it. And I think their goal is to have as big a footprint as they can, because it's going to give them the greatest net for cross-selling products. Other fintechs don't really offer sign-up bonuses very often. It's the traditional mega banks and, and other uh, large uh, banks that also offer these sign-up bonuses. And that's kind of why I like SoFi. It's a digital bank that feels like a, like a, a legacy bank in a way. So people can come and feel like there's a lot of that trust and see all the benefits, but then also realize that the awards are way higher, the fees are way lower, the speed and, and usability of the app is much larger. And that could be a potential way that they're getting more customers from the mega bank side than other fintechs, just because they're capturing a newer audience that might not have been ready to go to something like a chime or a current or something like that, just because they seem just a little bit more childish in a way. I don't know how to explain it other than that. Bill in the chat is saying, Tanner, the app stinks. People don't like certain aspects of the investment platform. I haven't heard anyone really complain about the SoFi Money app, which is really SoFi Relay and SoFi Money are the two biggest products. People forget about that. You don't hear about anyone complaining about the SoFi personal loan side or any of the lending sides. It's just the invest platform that a bunch of investors that come to this chat say, I'd rather use Robinhood. Well, that's not what the majority of people are even using at the platform. Level one options is something that they know people are talking about, but the high majority is going to more like automated investing ETFs. And that's why they're pushing those products out way, way more. How many people are actually trading options? I sell cover calls, I write cash secure puts, but out of the people that I talk to, I'm in the super minority on that. Many people that I talk to do not do anything with options. So I'm just wondering how big of a market is that? And is that market segmented and different from everything else? And I would think that that demographic is going to use a much different product than what SoFi is geared to. I just think that the whole options thing is overblown. Not many people are doing anything with options. And I've been investing for probably longer than most of the people that are watching or listening right now. And I got to tell you, this is something that has just caught on in the past recent years. You used to never really hear about options three, four, five years ago. And I still, I talk to a lot of people, people I work with, my friends, they don't really mess with options much, if any. And could this just be like a whole Fintwit thing? There are people that are more engaged with Twitter and whatnot. Are they more the option crabbies? I don't think it's the traditional investor. Well, you have to keep in mind the time frame around Robinhood going public and that whole GameStop thing. I think that really popularized this new wave of retail investors of this like you know, everyday average Joe type of investor, there's really two ways that you can go about it. If you're SoFi, you can be reactive in terms of 
looking at where the market is going and trying to latch on to that in terms of your product offerings, or you can be proactive in terms of saying, okay, well, this is our business strategy and business vision over the long term. Options, while they might be lucrative or while they might be profitable or while they might be supple in terms of the amount of people that use them, it's just not aligned with where a business is going. SoFi has more of that cross selling where the brokerage side of things is just one small part of their business. And Robinhood is like, that's their entire business. And I would rather have it SoFi's way because it reduces my risk as an investor in that company, because I know that the company will not live and die by the sword of volatility in trading markets, right? They will focus on the long-term investor. And if they don't want to trade any given year, that's fine because SoFi has them in that ecosystem where they can cross sell them other products and cover them end to end in terms of their finances. So I do believe it's a proactive decision that SoFi is making to not focus on options actively. And what we see in the app is the result of that. I think they're done going head to head with Robinhood. Yeah, I don't think they should try to go head to head with Robinhood. The people that I have talked to that really do like Robinhood, everybody just loves the platform and they have no interest in leaving. They truly love Robinhood. You're not going to get them to switch to SoFi or to anything else because there's already great platforms for trading and for options. I would much rather see SoFi go in the asset management direction, as I've said, build out the long-term investor, build out their suite of ETFs, add mutual funds. That's what is gonna take them to the next level because then they get in the 401 and 403B in the US for long-term investors, for asset management, for being a custodial for companies for their retirement plans. They will generate a tremendous amount of capital from that. That's how you are going to win and get to a top 10 financial institution because then you're competing with Morgan Stanley, Goldman, Wells Fargo, JP Morgan, Merrill Litt, Bank of America. And then you also are going to need to do business accounts. I can't stress enough how big small and medium-sized businesses are getting those accounts for their payroll under SoFi. Like that is where they need to focus the expansion, not on options. I really hope we hear something about that. And the tech platform, we need more information about it because that's what's going to get SoFi a much different multiple than traditional financial institutions. And they're one of the only ones that will be looked at in that light. We need to hear more about the AWS of FinTech. We need to hear more about the RFPs. We need to hear what regional bank they won, and I'm sure they can't disclose certain things, but it would be nice to know when they win these things and then when they're allowed to say who, we need to know who signed up because that's going to be huge for getting them in the room with other companies. We just need one big financial institution under our belt, and then it's smooth sailing probably. Well, they're, they're not competing with Robinhood partly because they can't. Frankly, people look at Robinhood and they're like, oh, there's no moat there. It's easy to replicate a user interface. Why has SoFi not done it? Why have other companies not done it? They can't. Uh, Robinhood continues to innovate. They're ahead in this space. SoFi, it's not going to kill them that they have just a, a kind of mediocre investing platform. And as far as the options, uh, if they were saying, you know what, we're going to completely move away from that, they would have just said no to options. They would have said, we're not doing this. We're not having this. Instead, they're saying, well, we're going to have level one options. We're working on that. That's in progress. That's going to happen. So they're wanting to move that direction. I, I, I just think it didn't uh, go as well as they planned and anticipated. And that happens. It's still an incredible company. It's just one of two products that are just kind of mediocre at SoFi. And that does not kill the bull thesis at all. It's all about the tech flat platform, like Steve said. Yeah, I, I, I think Roy is Roy is right. It's not, it's not a mention of trying to take Robinhood customers. It's, it's trying to get people from the money platform over to invest, right? It's one of the things that they highlighted for the Relay platform, which I thought was cool. They said, if our budgeting app works, that means we can save people money, which means they'll have more money to invest on our platform. If, if that's actually how deep they're thinking about it, and that's that's to a real effect, I mean, the, the compounding effects on having each individual product in the pie does actually compound. So I don't Steve, know about- we need tech talk for hitting huge fintech multiples, then Lambos. I'm not going to be able to explain it the way that I wrote it because I wrote a lot of things about how the banking industry is running on archaic software. And I cited a lot of things from some banking institution sites. I really do think that that is what is going to set us apart. And I've always said that this is a 
hold till 2030 for me, unless my investment thesis changes. Because if you're looking at SoFi as just a financial institution, there's some excitement there, but it's not going to be the huge movement that you're going to see in some of these other names over the next five to 10 years. If their tech platform is what I think it is, when you pair Galileo and Technicus together, what they are accomplishing internally and what they're looking to do externally, it could give SoFi a hybrid tech multiple. The bigger thing besides the tech multiple is the potential for reoccurring revenue coming from their competitors to power their back end, which will diversify their revenue and profits, but it'll be expanding because those types of deals I would expect are going to be very similar to other SaaS deals where you sign a five or a seven year agreement and your first two years are at the same level. And then you have fixed price escalators on an annualized basis going forward. After that agreement is up, there is very little chance, unless something goes very wrong, that a financial institution is going to move away from that underlying business because it's downtime, it's implementation, it's headaches, it is a nightmare. And once they get you hooked, as long as SoFi doesn't screw up, they can have a customer for life or for decades. With all the new regulations that have been coming out and will probably be coming out and all the new features for cybersecurity and identity theft and everything else, SoFi could be in a position where over the next five to 10 years, if this takes off and if you do get a couple of big hits, they're going to be in the room with more financial institutions. They could be generating reoccurring revenue from a decent size of the banking sector. And every single financial institution has to have some type of underlying infrastructure. And you look at Truist, and I have a funny suspicion, and I'm going to speculate that Truist is the one that we signed on the regional banking. And when I say that, and after I stop talking, I'll go to their investor presentation and find the slide. They've been making strides on their digital footprint. It kind of lines up to what the Technicist and Galileo combination would do for a company. This is not 1980 or 1990. And I'm going to date myself and Roy here, but Roy's going to remember banking 10, 15 years ago where None of this, you had to go to a physical branch. You couldn't open an account online. You, everybody has the ability to open up an account online through a phone or through a computer and never walk into a physical location. So competition is endless. So if competition is endless from a user standpoint of who we select, then that means that every other banking institution has to be front and center with technology to not just retain, but to get new clients. So these tech platforms for banking is going to be even more important. So if SoFi does become the creme de la creme, which we think they're going to be, or I think they're going to be, this could be a huge thing. And we could see a true S curve in a couple of years on what they're bringing in. So that's why I think that their tech platform is one of the most important things because they're generating profits from somewhere that nobody else is going to compete with them. JP Morgan Chase isn't competing with them there. Wells Fargo, Bank of, there, there's no competition from those players there. So that's huge. I was reading an article recently that was talking about how a lot of these banks are really seeking uh, FedNow. It's it's really hot right now. Uh, clients are wanting instant, uh, instant settlements and these sorts of things. But their technology, it's just not a, a modern solution. And so they need a technicist, for example, to sort of brighten up their, their company so then they can handle 24-hour, seven-day-a-week uh, transfers. Like, it's not eight hours anymore. It's, it's constant. Fed now might be one of the largest pushes to get legacy banks onto a newer uh, cloud-based infrastructure than potentially any other movement. Truist is one of the largest regional banks. Over the past year, their mobile app users has increased by 8%. Zelle Transactions is up 32%. Digital Transactions is up 9%. Client Satisfaction is up also year over year. This goes to show you that the regionals, or at least Truist, is taking the tech side very seriously. 
And if they're taking it seriously, the rest of the regionals and community and thrift banks have to be taking it seriously. Yeah. And we know that the big financial institutions are taking it seriously because the amount of money that JP Morgan is plowing into this. So this is real. And if SoFi can hit the home run on this, either way, SoFi issued stock at 11 or $12 to acquire Technosis. We didn't spend a dime of cash. It was all stock. Shareholders got diluted. And as a shareholder, I'm fine getting diluted for a good reason. And that was a good reason because you know what? Even if for some reason, I don't think this is going to happen, but hypothetically, if the tech side does not pan out the way that I think it's going to pan out, they'll make the money back on the, from the dilution from all the money that they're going to save on an annual basis over, say, nine to 11 years. And it's going to not just on the cost savings, they'll probably make it back quicker because they'll be able to deliver so many more products so quick, quickly compared to if they were dependent on other companies' roadmaps to do what they want to do that that deal will pay for itself in perpetuity. This is the big reason why I really do think that this is one of the only financial institutions, I'm not going to say fintech, because this is becoming more of a financial institution, even though they are a cloud-based firm. But this is what's going to give something that's perceived as a financial institution, a hybrid or a tech multiple, because they're going to be one of the only players that truly has a real tech aspect that is bringing in tremendous revenue and tremendous profits, hopefully down the line. And that's what I would love to hear more about from senior leadership, because it's one of the most under talked about and most important things to the SoFi investment case. I'll say uh, price action was interesting this week. I know that we, we track the fundamentals of the company as well, but almost every fintech went up by quite a bit this week. Uh, there's been a lot of good economic news that's supporting that. Uh, so it's not just speculation. There is some of that too. PayPal, you know, didn't go up quite as much as some of the others. There's some reasons for that. We're about to discuss that. Robinhood is interesting. Um, you know, look, look into that if, if you guys are looking for an interesting fintech. I'm not saying buy now. It's just, it's showing what, uh, when when the narrative changes on a company, what is, what's capable. I, I, I'm in Robinhood. I'm very bullish on it. Uh, but just look at that chart. And that's what many of these other beaten down fintechs near or at gap profitability that are growing immensely are capable of doing in a hurry once people are convinced and say, okay, yeah, there is an actual bull case here. The bear case is largely FUD. Yeah, we were up about, I think, four and a half percent this week, Monday through like the last five days trailing. We we gave up a lot of the gains from Wednesday because we were up about 8% and then we gave that back. The technical setup is really interesting though. If anybody wants to see more details on that, you should follow Michael Rowland on X. He's posting a lot about the technical setup for SoFi. It's looking to be similar to a lot of fintechs, which is bullish. It's, it's like a reverse head and shoulders or something. Thank you guys. Really do appreciate your time. But uh, to the members, we'll see you guys uh, tomorrow at noon, but we're going to go record it right now.